This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. Specializing in family law, wills, and estates for Flames fans in Calgary and southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187. Mention Fireside Chat and get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're 15 games into the season, and the Calgary Flames are on a four-game win streak, having won all four games in the last week. Once again, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, uh, I predicted it last week. I didn't think it would actually come true. What do you think of the fact that the Flames won all the games since we've recorded last? If it wasn't for that pesky Flames comeback in that Colorado game, I would have got all three. But unfortunately for the, our prediction game, you got it. But you know, it's like it's like the old Scooby Doo shows. If it wasn't for you, darn kids and your dog, I would have got away with it. Yes. Right. Darn yeah, you no, and your comebacks. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, this, and we'll talk more about this later, but this seems to be the story of the Flames this year, is they get down and they come back. Well, it's different than the fourteen fifteen edition of the Flames, where it was, like, they were getting outplayed and would just fluke out some goals late each game. Pretty much every time that they've been playing and trailing after two periods, they've been the better team in those games. And they just finally wear the opposition down, like in the Chicago game, until they t- eventually tie it and then win it. Yeah, I guess the big exception, well, not even the big exception, but the Sabres game kind of being the exception here. Let's start there. There was really first period Jack Eichel scored, second nobody scored. This was a very low scoring game. And then, of course, uh, Matthew, Sh- Matthew Kachuk at 1904 had to say, you know what, we might as well make this one interesting. And he ended up... Uh, tying it up, and then Johnny Goudreau at 2.40 into the OT ended up saying goodnight there. So I thought coming off the Toronto game, very similar game, the Sabres game, and a very defensive effort from the Flames, which is something we haven't seen from this team in a while. Yeah, and frankly, the Flames needed to play a lot better defensively, and you have to credit Carter Hutton for his performance. If it wasn't for him standing on his head, the Flames would have easily won that game three or four to one but he kept the sabers in it and the flames especially in the third period wore them down until rasmus anderson was able to keep the puck in at the blue line causing a turnover and goudreau lindholm kachuk goal and it was good to see anderson uh doing something remarkable with less than a minute left to go in a game considering his status as a rookie. Yeah, I mean, you and I have talked about him a lot. I think he's, he was over-ripened by this organization. I think that he's been ready to go in the NHL for at least a half season now, and he's just proven that to everybody. Oh, for sure. And that's the uh, one benefit with the Flames is that they've had enough depth where, like especially on defense last year, where they didn't need to rush Anderson. And this year, with the spots being opened, they were even starting Anderson in the farm. But then with the injury, he got called up and then took a spot. Another thing that I wanted to point out here, and we'll see this pretty much throughout the week. But one of the things I pointed out constantly last season, whenever the Flames would get in penalty trouble they would end up losing. And we're not seeing the Flames getting in penalty trouble this year. I mean, in the Sabres game, they only had four penalty minutes. In the Chicago game, they only had eight penalty minutes. So I think a lot of the Flames' success is they are able to play their five-on-four or five-on-five, and they're not having to play a lot of four-on-five hockey. Yeah, and if you look at the Carolina Hurricanes this past season, I think they were the least penalized team in the league. So it makes sense that that discipline and... I was reading online that someone had pointed out that the Flames were taking less offsides this year. And thinking back, like the Flames were always out of sync last year and they seem to be more on the ball this year with when it comes to that. So it's good to see that the Flames are having more internal discipline just on the little tactics in the game and all the little facets, whether it's uh, face-offs, offsides good little defensive plays 
and good forechecking, like all of the little detail work that goes into making a team successful, the Flames seem to be doing that better. And Sam Bennett's been too busy actually playing hockey to take dumb penalties this year. Oh, I know. Well, we've even said that in years past, that he seemed to get frustrated that he wasn't having success, then would take a dumb penalty, and then would get frustrated, which would cause more dumb penalties. And, like, it was just like a never-ending cycle of, like, frustration. Well, let's move on to the next game here. The Calgary Flames were at home to take on the Colorado Avalanche, a game I knew would be a... A fun game to watch. These two teams, I think, are very similar on paper. The big advantage that the Avalanche had and showed that to the Flames in the second was their speed. And in this one, the Flames really got themselves down 4-1 to one and ended up digging themselves out of a hole um, in the third period here. We had an early goal from Michael Backlund, which made a 4-1 after the second period. And then the third, Elias Lindholm, Sean Monaghan, James Neal, who has got his first goal as a Flame at the Dome, Mark Giordano and Michael Frolik all ended up scoring here to end up getting the Flames the win in this game with a 6-5 to five, uh, win. Now, as fun as this game was, I also think when you're playing a team like Colorado, you shouldn't have to have 11 goals scored. True. And you shouldn't have to score six goals to win. No, and frankly, that second period by Mike Smith, I think he even would probably think that like that was not an ideal performance in any way, shape, or form. And to his credit and the coach's credit for sticking with him afterwards, he played a lot better in the third period. And I think that will actually end up helping his internal confidence just because of the fact that he didn't get pulled despite having a really bad second period and was able to eke out a win and I think that moving forward, that just that tiny little bit of confidence might help him get past the little stupidities that have happened where, like, just a lot of really unfortunate goals, some of which weren't his fault, but two, two of them for sure were. Yeah, you could be right. Um, I think, I don't know, this is a weird game in a lot of ways. I mean, the first period I thought was pretty even. The second period we saw the first two goals, which you got two guys who are getting their first goals here. I think both their first NHL goals. Um, and that's not a good sign for a goalie. Backlund scored to sort of get the Flames back in it. Then Wilson and Soderberg scored. And really, I thought that the second period was mostly avalanche until that fight at the end of the second where Sam Bennett, we talked about him taking dumb penalties before. He took 17 minutes of penalty time. Well, he has to rack up the minutes, you know, so that way, he, you know, his discipline, he doesn't lose his uh, reputation. You know, he got a 10 minute misconduct, a five for fighting, and two for instigating. Yeah. Well, that was a very good set of penalties to take. The hit with on Jankowski with Cole, frankly, I thought that was more or less a clean hit. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, you know, it was a shoulder to shoulder. It's just that it, it, he really caught Jankowski. And, like, frankly, I didn't think that deserved a five minute major for him no i i think that the I, I think that everyone got their hands slapped because of the fight yeah and if there was no fight i don't think anyone would have got penalized true and um yeah and, and it, it was it was fun to watch because we usually don't see sam bennett go into beast mode like that but he had a pretty good fight yeah well he whenever he fights they tend to be really good like it I re- reminds me of Jerome. He didn't fight very often, but when he did, you knew it was going to be a good fight. Yeah. Well, like I still remember that uh, Ryan Johansson fight that he had. That was dynamite. So it, good on him, and he sparked the team. And it's always nice to see when players stick up for their line mates. That was something that was missing from the Flames for a, a number of years. I was just hoping he wouldn't get seriously hurt again if we had... Hamannick and then Bennett both sticking up for their teammates and both getting their jaws broken. We'd have to have everybody wear those jaw shields from now on. Yeah. You can go fight somebody, but, you know, wear protection. <laughs> well, just, you know how, like, in, in minor hockey, everyone wears a cage, and I guess even now in the NHL, everyone wears the half cage. Yeah. Just have the whole team wear the jaw shield, just in case. Yeah. Or if you can somehow get a jaw shield that flips down, so when it's time to fight, it goes from your eyes to your jaw. Yeah. 
Um, looking at the score sheet here, Ian Cole took 20 minutes of penalties, which is pretty much sitting out a whole period of the game. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you're done. <laughs> Just go home. <laughs> yeah. At one point, is it like, well, thanks for coming out, but uh, yeah, we don't home. we don't need you here now. Go exactly. away. <laughs> you know, and, and good for the Flames for coming back in this one, especially in the third. I mean, this is totally different story than what we've seen usually, which is the Flames collapse and give up games in the third. And this year they seem to be just coming back in the third, and that's when they're playing their best hockey. Well, as soon as Monahan, I think it was Monahan who scored to make it four two. Uh, as soon as that goal went in, I had a strong feeling that it was going to be another one of those nights where Calgary at least pushed it to overtime. Lindholm was the four two goal okay. on the power play, yeah. and Monahan was four three. My mistake. And but like when that goal went in, it was like okay, yeah, that we're back in this one, and because it was right early in the third period, so there was plenty of time for them to get back into it. And sure enough, you should you should almost go out in the first two periods, just uh, sit your first and second lines, and let the third and fourth line do their thing, then put your full bench out in the third period. And yeah. Say, all right, we can win it now. Yeah. You guys are ready. That they're all tired on the other side. Who cares if they have a three-goal lead? Let's go kill them. <laughs> you know? That's right. We'll spot you 40 minutes, and we'll still win this game. Yeah. And then Saturday night, the Calgary Flames played again here at the Dome, taking on the Chicago Blackhawks, and another good win for the Flames, uh, a 5-3 to three win. But not surprisingly, three Flames goals in the third period to win this one. Yeah, and frankly, it was a bit lucky that Chicago was leading it frankly at any point in this game like the five on three goal that was a good one but like after that the second goal it was a screen that that obviously you know it either hits you or goes in and the defensive collapse by Giordano and Brody on the sod goal which I I I'm still a little confused why that actually counted because you know he did kind of push the goalie out of the way and the puck came free because of that but yeah yeah i don't know we're not in the war room yeah but anyhow the flames frankly i thought controlled the play for basically the entire game and they like in the third period like i think the shots were like 17 to 3 or something like that they were just all over them yeah well even in the end if you take a look it was 41 15 shots in favor of calgary calgary won the face off 56 percent uh, less penalties, less hits, less blocks, but I think just the fact they outshot Chicago 41-15 says something about where Chicago's at this year. Yeah, well, Chicago's got a couple of decent pieces, but frankly... It's, ta- if, if it's the- time for them to go into a rebuild again. Yeah, like if they were smart, what they'd do is look at, you know, and say, hey, you want any of our key guys, we'll make them available, give us a whole bunch of youth. And, you know, I, they should almost do like what Calgary didn't do and sell off everybody before they get too old, like Jerome. And, like, it'll suck for them for a few years, but, you know, they did win three cups, so you can't really feel too bad about that. And just a note on this game, uh, David Riddick was net again for the Flames. And also... Zarnik and Stone sat for, I believe, the fourth game in a row for those guys. Yeah, I know. And of it, course, Prout sat. Yeah. Well, I think that you're gonna see Zarnik probably draw in sooner than Stone will. I think Stone's gonna be on the bench for most of the season. I think Zarnik for right now is the thirteenth forward. I don't think you mess with the lines with the way we're going. Yeah. And after those uh, four, after those three games, the Calgary Flames now sit second in the Western Conference behind only Nashville and first in the Pacific. We currently have 19 points, nine wins, five losses, one uh, overtime loss for a total of 19 points in 15 games, which puts the Flames on a four-game win streak. Matt, I know that we talked about them playing well in October, but I wasn't Honestly, I wasn't expecting... I was expecting some wins, but I wasn't expecting the quality of play we're seeing from this team so early. Yeah, and frankly, like, for most of October, like, they were getting wins despite having some serious disadvantages in terms of goaltending. And 
It, other than the second period for Mike Smith, I think the Flames goaltenders have played well in all of the games this month thus far. And they're getting points. Like As long as the Flames are getting any sort of decent goaltending performance, they usually walk away with two points. Yeah, and even when they're not, I mean, as as they are right now, they're able to score their way out of problems. But I guess that comes down, that comes to a big question is, you know, we've talked about goaltending. We'll probably continue talking about goaltending this episode. But can the Flames keep just outscoring their opponent to win with mediocre goaltending? Can they keep, you know, coming out in the third and, and winning game to 20 minutes left? Well, that's not the ideal way that you draw it up, but... Thankfully, the Flames have been fortunate enough to come back in those games. What they need to do, though, is hunker down a bit defensively, which will probably diminish their offensive capabilities a bit. But they need to have a little more balance in their game. And it, the, all, most of the games, frankly, have been really exciting because like, both teams are scoring a ton of goals. But you, it, that's not really a sustainable formula for success when like your goalie gives up four or five goals and you know oh we need to go and score that many plus one just to get two points like it's not sustainable like you can't count on Gaudreau, Monaghan, and Lindholm to continue to be three of the top 10 scorers in the league yeah and I mean it's it's good that we've been able I think to get through October bailing ourselves out that way but to me the big question has to be what are the what's the team going to do with their goaltending so Matt I'll pose you the question we saw this week Riddick start two of the three since we recorded last he started in Buffalo in the Chicago game um, can Riddick be the flame starter at least their 1A goalie for the rest of the year yes but is that the ideal way of that you'd want to do that? Probably not. Why uh, not? If he's good enough to be the starter, why not? Well, just because of the fact that it, because he's so inexperienced, he might falter along the way, and it's a little risky. He's doing well. Like I've been championing him for a bit, but... There's just some concerns that, you know, like they're, like that Chicago game, he did allow three goals on 15 shots. If he plays a lot more, he might run into the same problem he did last year, where he basically turned into what Smith is thus far this season. And I think the Flames will need a more permanent fixture as their starter, one way or the other. So, I mean, if we take a look at the numbers so far, we have Mike Smith, who started 10 games, played 10 games, has five wins, four losses, uh, one OT. He's sitting currently at a uh, .871, so 87% save percentage. Not great for what you want from a season starter. No. If we take a look at the other side, Riddick has played seven games, started five, won four, lost one. And he has a point nine two seven save percentage. Not quite what you want from a, a starter, but I mean, Riddick's only started five games, and generally, when you're coming in relief in those other two, you're going to be down because your team's down. But I'm well, not convinced that Riddick can be the starter this year. I don't like you said. I'm not sure down the stretch he can play that many games and shoulder that kind of workload. But the team seems to play better in front of David Riddick. Like when he's in net, I feel like the, the overall flames game, especially in their own end is a better game. And I'm wondering if maybe you have to run a one, a one B scenario and give Riddick the time to be that one, a guy as much. As I don't think it'll last all season and make Smitty earn it back. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that's what the Flames should do is basically play them more or less an equal amount of games and see how each one of them does. And I mean, right now, I don't even know if I do equal. Riddick has looked like the better goalie. So I just run with Riddick until either you lose confidence in him or, you know, you got to put the other guy in for a back-to-back -back or something. But I'd give Riddick, I think especially this early in the season when we're doing as well as we did, as we did last month, I should say, now's the time to experiment. I'd rather experiment with Riddick as the starter now than down the stretch when he might not be able to handle it. Yeah, well, like, say this week, we play uh, in Anaheim, then a back-to-back -back with L.A. and San Jose. 
frankly, I'd start Riddick against the Ducks, start Smith in the first game against LA, and then Riddick again in, against San Jose, and just kind of keep doing that kind of balanced play for each guy where like Riddick gets more starts but Rit Smith is starting from time to time and hopefully he starts working it out interesting you'd go that way I'd probably go Riddick in Anaheim and LA just because you know that LA is going to have crappy goaltending yeah um, but we can we can definitely see what the Flames will do and hold on and watch but yeah, I think, I don't know, I'm just, right now I'm not confident. Like you said, down the stretch last year, David Riddick couldn't play, you know, three games a week as the starter. I'm not sure he can do that now, and I don't think he's NHL starter material. Every year we see one goalie who shoulders a big load and looks like they're going to be a starter and never has to do it again. And I think that might be David Riddick this year, but I'm not I'm not comfortable, say, with him having 40 more starts. Yeah. And, you know, like... It- it's still early in the season, but there are options, and we discussed that last week, where if the Flames did want to make a trade, like, if you look at New Jersey and the New York Rangers, like, they're the second, or the third and fourth worst teams in the East, you're, you could get one of their goalies, either Lundqvist or Schneider, likely, so it's... And the cost for Lundqvist is a lot better bigger than the cost for schneider true but it you could go that route uh, and it wouldn't be that like it would be expensive but it wouldn't be that expensive so well and the issue that i'm having right now is we've talked about you know making a trade i don't really want to blow up this team right now i think that to get a big goaltender you're gonna have to give up significant pieces so i've been looking inside the organization and saying what can we do um, you know, what can we do within the team? And looking at Stockton, John Gillies has not looked good in the AHL this year. So I don't think we look at him. I mean, if he can't get his game together in the A, why would we bring him up to the NHL? And I feel like Tyler Parsons still needs some time to get adjusted to the AHL as well. So, you know, you're not bringing up Nick Schneider. You're not bringing up Mason McDonald. So I really think that you've got to run. You got really got no choice but to run Riddick and Smitty. Yeah. Well, one of the problems, like with, say, John Gillies, is he's been more of a blocking style goaltender just due to his size. And with the smaller goalie equipment I've noticed around the league, and even with Mike Smith, that pucks are getting through that they were used to have hit them and stay as saves. And now those pucks are squeaking in. Like, the first goal against Colorado was one of those goals on Smith where last year that's an easy save, no problem, but it trickled through because of the smaller goalie equipment. And I think that a lot of teams are having goalies that are underperforming just because they, they're going to have to make adjustments. Yeah, I think that could be part of the problem with with Smitty, but he just, to me, he's looking really slow this year. Um which isn't a fault of the pads changing. And he just seems like he's a step behind the, behind the play a lot. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I think as he's getting older, he's got to change his style too. Like how many times when we saw it last year, but we've already seen it at least once in the Colorado game, how many times he's been out of the net and trying to play that damn puck. Like I feel like it was okay when he was faster, but now he's slow. You got to keep yourself in the crease, buddy. Yeah. Well, he just needs to, get a little more confidence in his game like he's a good goalie and when like i've noticed that like when the goalies uh initially had to change over to the smaller pads like the actual goalie pads that they were giving up a lot of five hole goals where those weren't wouldn't go in before and they made adjustments and like things were fine and I th- to me, and I'm not a goalie, but that seems like an easy fix. You get a bunch of shooters out there, practice, and you work on his angles. Yeah, and it is a relatively easy fix. It just it takes a lot of repetition in order to get used to it. And it's small adjustments, but it does make a huge difference. 
Can you see any reasonable scenario where the Flames try to bury Mike Smith's four million two hundred fifty thousand dollar contract in the AHL this year? If he continues to struggle, like say that we're talking like Christmas time and he's still playing like this poorly, he's not going to be a flame. I think they'll send him to Stockton and get up Gillies or something or make a trade or something. Like You just can't have that level of poor goaltending for that long. Like He's the worst goalie in the league right now. So. And at the same time, I don't know. I mean, and I, you know, I'll say this right now. I don't know Gillies is a fix. Like, I think you almost flip a coin with Gillies and Rit- and Smith as to who's going to have a better game. Well, the thing is, if Gillies comes in and plays bad, that will be better than what Mike Smith has been. Like, he, Smith has been the worst goalie in the NHL, at, stat-wise, and... You know, even if Gillies, say, posts a 900 save percentage, which is borderline terrible in itself, that'll be a, like, a huge increase from, like, 870. So, it's not ideal, but, like, Smith has been abysmal, frankly. So, they need to, like, if he continues to play poorly, they're gonna need to make changes. And it even if you're getting below average to bad goaltending, that would still be an improvement. And the Flames have had bad luck with goalies. I mean, Smitty looked good last year, but if you think back to, you know, Hiller, um, Elliot, like they've been bringing in older goalies who just aren't looking good. And I don't know what the solve is. I don't think Parsons is ready for a couple of years. I honestly think that it's almost time to give up on Gillies. I think you probably see him move this year by the organization. Um, but I don't know what the what you do. We don't have a lot of money. I've heard people say we should go out and trade for Bobrovsky. He's probably going to get a $10 million deal, which we don't have simply if you want to keep Kachuk. So I don't know what you can do. Well, that's... Either the Flames are going to have to go after like an older goalie who's still playing well, like a Lundqvist, like a Schneider, or they're going to have to really pay a high price and go after a, a team that has two good young goaltenders. Schneider has a lot of injuries, though. I'm not sure he's that much better than Smitty. I know. Uh, that's the problem. Like, it's not. there's not a ton of guys out there. Like, When we talked about some couple weeks ago, I think that the best target probably Kincaid, but he'll stay in New Jersey. And then you got Simon Var- Varlamov, who's going to make it more money than we can afford. Like, I just don't know... How we get out of this hole? I know. Uh, like, if Montreal was doing bad, you might be able to get price, but they're doing well. But and again, looking at that contract, I don't even think we could afford to take price. No. It's just really frustrating because none of the Eastern Conference teams really seem to have two good young goaltenders like Anaheim did with Gibson and Anderson. And it's just frustrating because... The Flames could use, like, a anti-Ranta-style goaltender where just a decent backup on a good team and turns into a decent goaltender. And, unfortunately, there does not seem to be too many of those types available this year. So, right now, the Flames have almost $2 million free under the cap, and Carey Price is making $10 million. So, I don't know how you, even if he was available, I don't know how you'd fit that in. You'd probably have to package for Leak and Smith and then add on top of that, like what you're actually trading for. Which, you price. know, and I think right now with where we're at, I don't really want to move any significant roster player. I mean, no. even last week when we were talking about Brody and what, you know, how he wasn't doing well, I think that's one of the few pieces that you might get some return for. But even that brings up questions then of who plays in your top two. So. I think if they're going to make a deal, they've got to do it around Christmas time or the new year. I think you've got to wait this out for a little bit and see if we can turn our guys around because any trade is going to cost us dearly. Oh, for sure. And like you can already pencil in first round pick gone and probably our second round pick gone and maybe a guy like Shillington. And I think the team's going to be hesitant to move another first round pick. Yeah. And... 
Yeah, uh, it's just difficult because there's not a ton of options. I, I think if you're going to make that move, you're going to say goodbye to Gillies, you're going to say goodbye to Shillington, and you're probably going to say goodbye yeah. to a roster player. Probably. And, like, it, it'll it be tough one way or the other. But I, I just don't know right now if, what if there are any good options available, frankly. Well, and normally when you see teams get stuck with bad goaltending – it can't be fixed mid-season. No. Like, you know, there's enough forwards, there's enough defensemen, you can make those kind of trades and often get yourself out of a hole. Really, if you look, there's only, what, 60, there's 31 teams now, so just over 60, say 62, maybe 64, if some teams have three goalies, like uh, the Hurricanes, but let's say 64 goalies. There's 64 goalies in this league. It's tough to make moves for them. Yeah. And even if we did bring one in, now you got to get rid of one. Yeah, and, and like you look at like the teams that are say out of a playoff spot. Well, most of them, the reason why they're out of a playoff spot is because their goaltending is abysmal. So that doesn't even help you if you're wanting to actually do anything, because like if you're going shopping on their at for their goaltender, like they're they're not good. So what's your point? Like, there's only a couple of teams where they actually have decent goaltending and are bad. And it's just kind of a tough spot to be in where, like, a team can be both bad and have good goaltending. I could see potentially, it's a bit off the radar, but in that same light, if teams are bad but have good goaltending, I could see if the Flames want to do that. Jake Allen out of St. Louis potentially being a target. Uh, that was going to be one of the people I was thinking. It, he looks like a guy who needs a change of scenery. I've liked... The last time we brought in St. Louis goalie with Elliot, didn't work too well. Allen, when I've watched him play, when he's good, he can be one of the top five goalies in the league. It's just when he's good. <laughs> And that seems to be the overriding problem. Like, he, he's he been right there with Smith in terms of being bad this season. And it's just tough. You know, like, that would be a good acquisition, I think. But it, yeah. But again, it's not going to come cheap. No. And that's the thing with goalies. Like, especially mid-season, you will overpay if you want to go out and, and acquire a goaltender. Yeah. Like, his numbers are 399 goals against average, 879 save percentage. It, he's only better than Smith in both of those regards. So, you know, not good. But I want to check on something here. Um, I want to just see what the money and term difference would be. But how would you feel if the Flames were to go out and um, moving two goalies who might need a change of scenery if you were to move Smith for Jimmy Howard? That wouldn't be too bad, I guess. Like, You'd have to give something up. I mean, Howard's 34. He's making a million bucks more than Smith, so it's not a long-term fix, but I wonder if it would be enough of a fix to steady up the goaltending for a playoff run. That'd be, like, an adequate... Like, I don't think you'd have to add really much of anything beyond, frankly, because like, Howard's not that good. So yeah, but neither Smith. True. Like you'd have to add something, but it'd be more like a, a third round pick or something like that. Like I'm not. We can give him Lazar. Yeah, like Lazar and a third DA. Yeah, that'd be fine. I think the other thing we have to be careful of here is it's easy to say let's go and make this trade or that trade, but I mean bringing in a guy like a Howard or an older guy like that, you're often looking at a guy on the last year of his deal, and that becomes a rental and. The question becomes, do we want to rent and do we want to pay rental fees or can we find somebody who's younger um, and be a stopgap? I think there's some options this summer. This might sound crazy, but I think if we look up north, uh, Talbot could be an option. Uh, that would be, seriously, Cam Talbot would be my number one acquisition target for this offseason. And I think if you don't have a guy like Dubé who you're confident with the backup, I could even see going with like a Talbot Cam Ward pairing to get you another veteran guy in there to play 20 games. Yeah. Now, here's a question for you. Say Talbot makes it to UFA Day and the Oilers are still trying to re sign him. Do you throw a three year, seven and a half million at him? 
Seven and a half per? Yeah. No, I don't think we can afford to. I think we're gonna. Ha- I think we're probably gonna have about four million, like we have for Smith or less, because we've got to find some money to re-sign Chucky. Oh. Uh, I don't know about you. Yeah. I think three years is not a bad term. I just don't know how much money we're gonna have, and I think that's gonna be one of the things that's going to hinder us when it comes to. Um, you know, who we can sign and, you know, we can't go after Bob. We can't go after some of those top guys because of that. And I think the big thing that's going to hinder us is going to be how much money we can spend. And if we want to move a guy out in order to make room for that. Yeah. Well, I, I would figure that both Smith or stone Smith and for leak would be like the easy cap dump type guys. Like Smith's not coming back probably. So yeah, you could conceivably do it. It's just, I think you're gonna have to free up six and a half million just for Kachuk. Yeah, so I think just dumping Stone alone sort of pays for Kachuk. Yeah, and for Leak, there's plenty of teams that would take for Leak. Yeah, I think there might be a strategy to hanging on to for Leak though for an expansion draft. True. We'll see. Um, but yeah, I mean, just looking at the list here of guys who are available this summer. There's not a whole lot of premier goalies that will be within that, you know, that list of, I guess, guys who are affordable, but who are good. Like, there's a lot of affordable guys, but they're not very good. You know, we don't want Andrew Hammond. I mean, well, you know, look we at want... uh, back when the Flames signed Troy Brower. Like, that was right when the Flames really desperately needed a right winger. And the UFA market for right shooting right wingers was David Backus and Troy Brower. And that was it. Like, there was nobody else. And so we did shop and get Brower because, frankly, we needed a body who could play right wing. And, you know, we were hoping for more from him. But, you know, like it's that same kind of a situation on this year's goalie market where it's like, okay, there might be one or two good players, but it's going to be a lot of mediocrity too. And, you know. Well, and just when I look at the goalies, there's either sort of like looking at the guys who are set to be UFA now, Pekka Rene's off the table, but there's going to be really high, like Bob and Varlamov who's going to make a lot of money. There's going to be Jimmy Howard, Cam Talbot, um, Michael Newverth, maybe Ryan Miller, sort of your mid-level guys, none of whom I think are great goalies. And then you're going to have, you know, your Niemis, your Peter Budai, Al Montoya, just sort of your leftover backups. Yeah. And I would, like I, I see, would actually... And I don't see that one sleeper guy. I don't see the, um, you know, Scott Darling or the Ranta, that backup who's poised to break out besides maybe Keith Kincaid. Yeah. And I would actually consider Cam Talbot as one of the top tier guys, because frankly, the Oilers, if it wasn't for him and McDavid, the Oilers are the worst team in the league. So I think he's a top tier guy, but I don't think he'll get paid like it. No. I think there's going to be more teams who are going to wait for Bobrovsky, Varlamov, Howard uh, to come off the board first. And I think the Flames might be able to sneak in with an offer and get him for a bit cheaper. Yeah. Well, that's why, so like, making that's why he, like, Talbot would be my number one choice is just simply for the fact that he's not going to command as much money and you have a better likelihood of actually getting him. And he's pretty much at, at the same level as either Bobrovsky or Varlamov. I don't know about that. I think Bob's probably one of your top three goalies in the league. I'd say Rene, Bobrovsky, and Price are ahead of everybody. I'd act, maybe uh, Vasilevsky. Uh, I'd... My current top five are uh, Price, Lundqvist, still. Um, Talbot's one of them, Vasilevsky, and Bobrovsky. Another guy that might be kind of interesting if you're, I mean, you, I guess it's an RFA, so probably not, but uh, Jonas Corpusalo could be an interesting backup. Um, he's an RFA, but otherwise, this pickings are slim. I mean, maybe, maybe if you're looking for a, a younger backup, you go with a Michael Hutchinson. Yeah, but he's making one point three. But you know, I think at that point, I'd rather grab a Robin Leonard or even a Peter Morazic. Yeah. So, insert random goalie here, basically. I actually think Peter Morazic might be able to break out. Yeah. 
So we'll see. But I, I think it's right now. This seems like a good hockey team being held down by mediocre goaltending. Yeah, I agree. And if they can solve that problem, I think these flames can really break out. Well, frankly, like the, before the season started, like this, where the flames are at with 19 points after 15 games is roughly where I was expecting them to be. It's just how they got there was not at all, you know, like the offense has been just so exceptional and it's helped to compensate for frankly terrible goaltending like if it, they've won in spite of their goaltending but they can't keep doing that no like if it if the flames had even just average goaltending they're by far the best team in the league right now like they're they're at yeah. a nashville easily but uh, unfortunately they've been held back quite a bit by their bad goaltending and hopefully that changes soon one way or the other we should move on from goaltending yeah definitely so question for you and this has been posed online this week we're seeing dylan dubé back in the lineup he was scratched for a bit playing on a line with hathaway and Derek ryan we'll call them the fourth line right now um and i've i've asked you this question since training camp do you still think Dylan Dubé should be playing in the NHL in bottom six minutes, or is it time to send him back to the AHL to play starter minutes? I'll give you my thoughts here. I think if we look at Valimaki and we look at um, Anderson, they have less holes in their game than Dubé does. Dubé has some obvious things that need to be polished, and the AHL is there for polishing your game. That's the whole point of it. So I feel like he might be better served working with a team of development coaches playing top-line minutes then right now where he's playing on the Flames roster, he I don't think he's going to get better and polish a lot of those pieces playing where he is. What are your thoughts? Well, one of the problems with Dubé that is his lack of on-ice awareness in terms of where the opposing defenseman is. <laughs> like, he has been nailed three times already this year. And, like, that hit by Keith, like, that really... that was more on Dubé than it was on Keith. Like, he was just finishing his check and not expecting Dubé to turn. But, like, he's going to end up getting seriously hurt if he doesn't learn how to play at a higher level. And I think him skipping the AHL was a misstep just because of that. Like, in terms of his skill, he's an NHL player. But... He needs to learn how to play the pro game, and I think that he's not used to players being as fast as they are and coming in on him as fast as they are. Well, being the guy in the dub, I think he was better protected than he is, you know, for the Flames right now. True, and I think so. He didn't need to worry about that. He had other guys that would take the fall for him. Yeah, and I think that he needs to just get some ice time in Stockton. And frankly, the Flames could just slot Zarnik in and recall any uh, number of guys. Like, you could uh, bring Peluso back up just to be the 13th guy, just to warm the bench. Well, yeah, I mean, Peluso, we got a whole bunch of veteran guys. I mean, you could bring up Buddy Robinson, Tyler Grailvac. Like, there's tons yeah. of these kind of veteran plugger guys. Not, I, I don't mean pluggers like, you know, fighters, but pluggers like you could plug them in and you're not waiting for development time on them, but I feel like that 13th forward could be filled by a lot of guys. Yeah, for sure. And, like, you don't necessarily want to bring, like, Manjapani or Fu up yet just because they too... Unless you want to stick them in that spot. Yeah, and I think Zarnik could use some ice time just to round out his game a little bit and get more of an opportunity to draw in. And, yeah, because there's... Some potential there for Zarnik to be a good player. It's just that he has some defensive deficiencies as well. I feel like, you know, Dylan Dubé earned the roster spot out of camp and good for him. And he had that spot. But I think that right now the best thing for them is to reassess where he's at. And instead of playing him in fourth line minutes, um, send him to the farm and bring someone else up there. Like you were saying, uh, you know, maybe give Zarnik that spot, maybe bring Peluso up, maybe even give Peluso some play time. Um, you know, six foot four on that fourth line with Hathaway might not be a bad idea, but I just, I don't see the benefit anymore of having Dubé. Here. Neither do I. And like with his training camp, he definitely de deserved to be here from day one. It's just, 
after 15 games, yeah, not so much. You got got to work on a few things. Come back and be awesome, like in February or March. Yeah, no, for sure. And maybe that's what you do is you send him back down. I mean, it doesn't mean he's down forever. We'll keep watching you, and we'll bring you up when you're ready. Yeah, and frankly, like I think that he'd be a decent player to have on the Flames during the playoffs because of his foot speed. Because like when Pittsburgh won those two cups, like that their third and fourth line guys would get in on you quickly. And that was part of what made them so successful is that they just, the other teams couldn't deal with the foot speed. And I think Dubé contributes that to a large extent. So he would be a useful player down the road in the season. But I think for right now, he just needs to get a little better and more adapted to the NHL game. I'm not saying we would see this from Dubé because we don't know yet, but after getting rocked in a big hit like he did in the Chicago game, we often see young guys, especially rookies, especially smaller rookies, who become a little gun shy when they now see the big player coming at them. They don't make the play they should. They just try to get rid of the puck to not get hit. Yeah. And I think that eliminates a lot of Dubé's effectiveness. And I think, you know, the fact he hasn't even scored yet, he's had some really good chances. I think put him in the AHL, let him get that monkey off his back, let him get a whole bunch of goals. Um, and bring him back when he's got that confidence back. But right now, I think we're... I don't want to say it could be like a Sam Bennett where he could be hindered by not going to the AHL, but I think the best place for Dubé right now, if he was in the top six, I'd say, yeah, keep him there if he'd earned his way up. But I don't think Anderson goes down. I don't think Valimaki goes down, but I don't see the point in keeping Dubé around. I agree wholeheartedly. So we'll see if they make a roster move. Do you think Peluso is the guy to bring up? Yeah, probably, just because like Zarnik basically plays a similar game to Dubé, so when you would normally slot Dubé in, you could slot Zarnik in his spot. And What about your boy Lomberg? Again, you could do that, but I think the six foot four guy carries a little more punch than Lomberg does. It's probably the same reason that Dalton Proud is still here. They want that sandpaper option if they need it. Yeah, exactly. And frankly, most of the Flames players are skill guys, but every once in a while you need a thug to, you know, be there just in case. Sam Bennett. Yes, exactly. Your guy who takes 17 minutes of penalties because he's a fighter. Yes. He will break you. <laughs> that's right. And then you'll break his jaw. Oh, no, wait, that's Hamannick. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll see if the Flames make a move there. I think you might go another week before you see that move. Um, we've even seen Dubé scratch so far, which, again, not a great thing for a rookie. But the Flames have got another week of sort of back-to-back -back games and then three days off, the 12th, 13th, 14th. I think if you're going to make a move, you do it. Also because the team's – I don't know, this sounds weird, but I think because the team's in California, you almost just leave Dubé behind. Yeah. Oh, he missed the bus. Oh, darn. <laughs> No, he, he, but know. you know what I mean. Like you, you're in California, it's easy to send them back to Stockton from there. You don't like quickly. Let's all leave an hour early and leave him here, and he can drive to Stockton on his own. <laughs> That'd be horrible. You know, we're that's not, not the Florida that's not how you get a guy motivated. We're not the Florida Panthers. You know, leaving their coach there. Here, Maybe call it's a cab, Smitty. <laughs> but yeah, I could see him kind of leaving them in in Florida. Yeah. And it, again, it makes a recall really easy as well. Yeah, true enough. You know, like I, I think there might be a Ross transaction because of that. Mm -hmm. Well, we've talked about some of the Flames who maybe aren't looking as hot, but we have some Flames that are really looking good this week. Sean Monahan was awarded the first star of the week for the NHL. And we've got three Calgary Flames who are in the top 10 for points, Kachuk, Goudreau, and Monahan, as well as Lindholm, who's 13th in the league. When's the last time you can remember three Flames players being in the top 15? I, I have no idea. Like, it, it's... You'd probably have to go to the mid-80s. Mid to late 80s. Like, when the Flames had, like, five to four, 50 goal scorers or whatever it was, or four 50 goal scorers. Like, it, something ridiculous like that. I know they had that one year. and No, no year since the pedestal jerseys this probably happened. No. Well, we only had Flurry back then, so, you know, it's... Come on, we had Corey Stillman. There's a quality player there. German Tidoff. Oh, scary. <laughs> uh, Andrew Castles at one point. He was supposed to be our savior. Yeah. What about Valbure? 
They had some decent players, but actually Val Burry was a decent player. Yeah. I think if this team had a better team around him, he would have done a lot better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, it's good to see, good to see Kachuk in that list too, being that he's on the second line and we've seen that three M line reformed. And as we know, the three M line is really the shutdown line. I got to talk to, um, Michael Backlund about that and just how comfortable he's feeling playing with those guys again, that Kachuk's still able to put points up. And that's really what we saw last year. And I think we're going to see more of this year is those two guys set Kachuk up and Kachuk's the guy that puts it in the back of the net. Yeah. Now here's a thought. Uh, what if you were to switch the lines up and separate Gaudreau and Monaghan? And put who with who? Uh, Lindholm and Neal on the first line, Monaghan with Kachuk and right winger whomever. Right now, I think, why mess with a good thing? Uh, it's just that Maybe. it worked well in the Colorado game, and that's why I, was, I brought it up. Yeah, but more often than not, the Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm has worked even better. True. I think that James Neal is turning out to be too slow to play with Goudreau and Lindholm. Um, I don't want to say he's, you know, molasses like Troy Brower, but I just don't think that he would be able to keep up with those two. And I think it would cause some issues there. Yeah. I think if you're going to do that, you might put Backlund on the first line to add some defensive ability there. Sort of a two-way forward. Yeah. But right now, I figure, you know, we've got kind of Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm is line one. The 3M line is line two. Bennett, Jank, O'Neal is line three. That line's performing really well. I don't want to really move that around because I think Bennett is... I think Bennett's finally feeling comfortable with those guys. And I think if we move it around, he might not. And then Ryan, Dubé, Hathaway is fourth. And like you said, you could take easily Dubé out and put Zarnik in. But the top three right now, I wouldn't touch them. Yeah. Yeah. And I know this coach likes to try things and put things in a blender when we're down. But, I mean, especially considering that Monaghan and Lindholm and Goudreau are doing so well together, why break them up? Right? So, I don't know. May maybe later in the season. But right now, run with what you got. I agree. Well, we'll definitely, we'll definitely start seeing some changes as injuries happen. So, Matt, we got a question this week when we asked fans what they want us to talk about from a fan in the UK, a United Kingdom Flames fan. I know there's actually a UK team called like the Gulliford Flames. I wonder if he found us through them. They have a flaming G for their logo. Um, and he asked, for the last couple of years, the Flames have had loads of shots but struggled to score a lot of goals. During this time, we've normally not given up many shots but have conceded a lot of goals on those shots. As a UK fan who can't watch a lot of games, why? And this is from John Wallace Howell on Twitter. So I'll give my thoughts here. John, I think it's a really simple answer. The Flames have got a lot of shots, but they haven't got a lot of good quality shots or danger zone chances. If you look in the last couple of years, the Flames have been pushed out of the offensive, um, let's call them the offensive sweet spots by a lot of teams. A lot of their shots have come from the boards. A lot of their shots have come from the far side of the hash marks. Matt and I have noticed this a number of times when the Flames are in the offensive zone, there's not a guy in front of the net. They're not picking up their own rebounds. So I think they're getting a lot of shots, but not a good quality set of shots, and that's why they're struggling to score goals. Totally in the reverse, I think the Flames have given up a lot of... And I wouldn't say, um, as he says, we've normally not given up many shots, but the ones we do are huge defensive breakdowns. Like last year, we'd see Dougie Hamilton with just stupid defensive breakdowns that give a guy prime shooting space. So I think that when the Flames in the past sort of gave up, um, you know, gave up ice in their own zone, it was prime shooting space. And I think this year, one thing they're doing really well is keeping shooters to the boards and not, even when they lose their man, they're out of position by that time, the offensive team. So what do you think, Matt? Yeah, well, this is... One the main complaint I've always had about with Corsi is that not all shots and shot attempts are the same. And if you're a goalie, like if the puck is being shot at you from close range, you just simply do not physically have the ability to react to the shot. Because by the time your brain actually reacts of, oh, the puck's coming this way, the puck's already by you and in the net. And so, like, if you're not getting a ton of shots from in tight, 
you're not likely to score a lot of goals. And, like, if you look at most of the times when the Flames score, it's cross ice passes for one-timers that end up doing it, which that does general... Like, if you're going to score from the outside, that tends to be how those type of goals are scored. But that mostly requires a defensive breakdown from the other team and like if you're getting 40 shots but they're all from the perimeter well like great you got you made the goalie have some exercise but that's basically all you're doing like you're not actually going to score much with those and like you look at the pittsburgh game for example we lost nine to one and yet we won the corsi battle and it's like well okay sure you know, like, that helps, I guess. Uh, you know, it, frankly, like, there's a term for it, the home plate area in front of the net, which I think extends to the hash marks on the inside where the face-off circles are, and then goes to a point matching between those two spots. And if you're not generating a ton of shots from that area you're not going to score as many goals. And when you see other teams score on us, most of the time, like take the Chicago game, for example, the Taze goal, he's standing right in front of the net. The Sod goal, he's right in front of the net. And the other one was a point shot that hit, went through a screen. Well, when you're getting chances from in close like that, you're going to score. And unfortunately, the Flames do give up too many of those type of shots. And they don't really get too many of their own. And They're often today called high danger chances. Yeah. And it's frustrating because of the fact that, you know, you, they are doing a good job of being relentless on the forecheck and getting it in on the other team it's just that they're not getting into the better areas to score goals and the other thing i think we've seen a lot of in the last couple of years and matt you can tell me if you've seen different but we see the flame the flames play with the puck too much they like to pass especially between their two defensemen and often they're passing around too much and they just have to take a shot and it's not the best shot they could have got it'll be oh crap we got to shoot it let's just put it on net yeah especially on the and power play yeah, like, the, you know, they're they're passing around or they're trying to go behind the net or someone's out of position. So they always get a shot off, but it's not the shot they want. And sort of to what you were talking about earlier about high danger chances. So I pulled out the last couple games here. In the Colorado game, Calgary had 19 high danger chances for to eight against. In the Blackhawks game, they had 11 for and six against. In the Maple Leafs game, it was eight and eight. And the Washington game, they had 11-4 and 9 against. So I think this year, a lot of the reason they're having success, they've got a man in front. They're picking up their own rebounds. But the last couple of years, they just haven't, as you mentioned, they haven't been getting good quality shots. Yeah, and like that's why like I was not really a fan of Dougie Hamilton much. Because like while on the advanced stat chart, he's great. He's one of the best in the league. Rarely were his shots of a good quality. Like he'd basically step into the zone, take a shot. Well, oh great, he created a scoring chance. But you know, it, those are the type of shots where like anybody who's ever strapped on a pads at any level could flag that down. And well, and how many times did Gio have to bail him out last year? Like, exactly. You'd see times when he'd blow his check, and you'd almost see Gio, you know, even though you didn't see his eyes, but you almost saw him just rolling his eyes as Gio would have to go pick up the man and the check that Dougie blew. Like, I think when Dougie was on the ice, usually he was on the ice against the other team's top lines. And, you know, when he'd blow a chance, he was putting a good scorer in a good position. Yeah. And now, like, that's still happening, but it's not nearly to the same extent well every team blows their their coverage oh yeah well look at the sod goal you know he split geo and brody and went in for a breakaway mm -hmm. it happens but it's not as likely with those type of guys out there yeah so i think that to me that's the big difference this year is yeah they've had a load of shots in the in the 
past, but they haven't been great shots from great positions that are going to beat a goalie. And this year, the Flames, I think, are taking smarter shots from that home plate, like you were saying, but also from different angles. I mean, we've seen a couple, you know, right from the corners of the net. We've seen a couple from right in front. We're seeing a lot more screening this year, I think. So I think that they're just they're getting better quality shots, and that's why the Flames are having better success. Yeah, for sure. And hopefully that continues and they can try to limit some of the goals against and like you have to figure that like the other teams are going to get chances and if the goaltending can actually stop some of those high danger chances then the flames will obviously have a better chance to win it's when like smith has a game like he did in the second period against colorado that it makes it more difficult where like, they only had, I think you said, six or eight high-quality chances in the game, and yet they scored four goals in that period. Yeah. Like, you know, if you're allowing everything in, well, th- that's not going to help. <laughs> yeah, I'm just seeing this year, I think the Flames offense just a lot more refined. They're passing less. They seem to be more confident. How many times in the past would we see it where a guy had the puck behind the net He'd shoot up the boards. Nobody was there. Oh, I know. And he'd go right, right out of the offensive zone, and the defenseman has to go get it. Now everyone's got to come out just to go back. Like, just those little, you know, things that are, I would say, hockey sense. It's like, come on, guys, keep it in the offensive zone. We can't get shots if we're not in the offensive zone. And that's when they would then just fire it on the goalie and hope it went in. Yeah. I know. And that, oh, just like with the faceoffs and the, all the other offsides and all that kind of stuff, they are getting better at it this year. Just that little attention to detail. So, John, thanks for listening from the UK. We'd love to know what made you a Flames fan from the UK, and sorry that you can't watch the games, but we're glad that you're listening to our show. And that also brings me to, I just wanted to shout out to everyone listening. We would love it if you told at least one of your friends about our show. Uh, maybe you have a friend like John who's in the UK and can't follow us. Maybe you've got a Flames fan who wants some more in-depth Flames um, you know, discussion. But if everyone could tell one friend about the show and tell them how to subscribe, either follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Fireside Chat, on Twitter, Fireside Podcast, go to the website, firesidechat.ca, where they can subscribe to get us in their inbox every week when we come out. Tell one person about the show. Get one more person listening to us. And, I mean, that's going to help us increase our audience, which we would love. But it's also going to make sure that guys like, you know, John and people that have written in the past who are diehard Flames fans, especially not in Calgary, have some way to listen to their team. So that's something we'll ask from everyone this week is please tell a friend about Fireside Chat. And Matt, we've got ourselves a new sponsor. We heard him at the top of the show. Robert Woodward, uh, an attorney for Altador Law, has come on for the rest of the calendar year to help us out. So shout out to Robert. Thanks for coming on and supporting the show. It helps us a lot, and we hope that everyone will take advantage of his great deal. He's giving $100 off any legal service. So uh, give Robert a call, and if you need some legal service, if he's a family lawyer and he does wills in the States. So if you're uh, marrying an Oilers fan, you should probably get that will in place. Or, or your, uh, you know, prenup in place if you're a Marin Oilers fan. That's probably a good idea right there. If maybe it's cause of family issues, give him a call. But, um, yeah, you, use his service. He's a good guy. It's time now, Matt, to end the show. But before we do, it's the weekly prediction game. And as we talked about at the beginning, I pretty much won last week. I took a flyer and said the Flames were going to win everything. Buffalo, Colorado, and Chicago, they did. Um, you thought they would win Buffalo and Chicago, but lose to Colorado. So this week we've got three games on the docket. We've got, uh, the game in Anaheim, the game in LA and the game in San Jose. This is their usual California street, uh, run. What do you think? Three games. How's it going to go? Like you, I'll be bold and say they're going to win all three. Seven game winning streak. so? Let's hope that's not the streak of the season. Like, usually they get a seven-game winning streak, and then they lose seven. Like, we better not kind of, you know, blow our load this early in the season. True. I'm going to say that they win in Anaheim, because I think, as you mentioned earlier, Anaheim is not doing great. I think they'll win in L.A., because when you're down to Jack Campbell and Peter Budai as your goaltenders, you're pretty much asking to lose hockey games. 
but I think they're going to lose to San Jose. They It seems to me like they've struggled in San Jose in the last little bit. And I still think San Jose is a good team. And San Jose is also a big hitting team. And I think that they can uh, knock the Flames around a bit. So I'm going to go with two games. I'm going to say the Flames will win in Anaheim and L.A. and lose to San Jose. It's also the back-to-back, that San Jose game. So, Matt, anything else you want to talk about before we sign off for the week? Uh, just uh, wanting to remark on what's going on with Vancouver and Edmonton. Jeez. Top three teams in the Pacific, Calgary, Edmonton, and Vancouver. I know. It's like, this is not right. But, you know, there's always teams at the beginning of the year that somehow go on a winning streak or look good and then end up fading. And you said it before the show. I mean, one injury to to the Oilers and they're done. Yeah. Like if either McDavid or Talbot miss any time, like they're screwed. And I really think in Vancouver, um, Elias Pettersson has put that team on his shoulders and run with it. And that can only go so far as yeah. well. Yeah. Like, especially with such a small player, you know, you can't really expect him to carry the load the entire year but the the pacific division's been interesting i mean san jose is looking i'd say okay anaheim really faltering this year la i think with quicks probably out for a couple months that's really going to tank their season vegas not looking as hot as everyone thought they were going to but i think colorado is a team that i underestimated going into this one and they're still looking hot yeah Frankly, I would uh, would have expected Colorado to have about four or five less points than they do, and be more. I think with a goalie tandem of Varlamov and Grubauer, those guys are going to steal you more games, and you should probably win. Yeah, and if it wasn't for those two guys playing as well as they are, then they probably would be down where Vegas is. Vegas, I'm not really surprised. They're not. They weren't a very good team last year. It's just that. Nobody had a book on how they played, and and it's hard to build a book on the fly, and that so they kind of caught everybody off their game. And now that like teams have had the full summer to analyze how they play, you can shut them down. Like they they don't have yeah, the I, offensive depth. I think that's part of it. I think if you look around the locker room and you say, guys, were the you know the the toys nobody wanted? Were all the players that everyone you know, when you play Texas Hold'em and you got to throw two cards away, were the two cards everybody threw away that nobody wanted, let's show them differently. Yeah. And I think maybe that Vegas shooting last summer might have rallied the team and the city around them too. Yeah, I but agree. I, th- I I think, yeah, they got Packer ready and they got, um, they got Marc-Andre Fleury, but I don't think that's enough to get them as far as they did last year. No. Fleury's another goalie on the decline. Yeah. I Honestly, I don't think Vegas makes the playoffs. No, I don't think Edmonton does either. No, I think uh, San Jose makes it in lieu of Vancouver and probably Arizona, actually, instead of Edmonton. You think so? Yeah, I think Colorado is going to last and be that third team. Well, they're not in our division. Oh, that's true. Yeah, no, they'll be a wild card team at least. Yeah, but, I'm expecting um, five teams from the Central uh, in the playoffs this year. I don't expect there to be four and four this year i th- i think before arizona i don't know i think anaheim's got enough gas left in the tank for one more playoff appearance I think mean, they have a long run but i think the ducks can muster up one more playoff appearance yeah i think they might be a one and out but i think that they can muster up one more appearance yeah i i'm I think that the coyotes are a good enough team defensively to hold the fort and like honestly, I think that it's going to end up being a, a four-way dogfight between Anaheim, Arizona, Vegas, and Edmonton for that last playoff spot. And it, like I, frankly, I think that you might see six teams uh, in the Central being better than the third team in the Pacific. In the Central, I'm surprised Winnipeg's a wild card. Like I was expecting them to have a really good year this year. Yeah, and so am I. Like I just I don't see it. Like Vancouver and Edmonton, I don't think are sustainable to the extent. I think Calgary and San Jose are pretty much locks for spots, and then it's just a toss up after that for whoever I the third like one to is. See, 
I kind of like to see Edmonton get in as the Cinderella team just because you know they're going to get crushed. Oh, yeah. It doesn't matter if we play them or San Jose does. It's, yeah, it's going to be a five, six game series and bye bye. Even Vancouver. I mean, if they got in as the as the uh, Cinderella team, there's no way that Elias Pedersen can run you. No, because all, you, all you would need to do, literally, if you're the opposition, is hey, Pedersen's on the ice. Hit him. Hit him many or times. Put the, put the 3M line out to neutralize yeah. him. Yeah. And hit him. <laughs> like, just, yeah. he, he's a small, fragile man-boy, you know, like... I just, also don't think Vancouver's yeah. got good enough goaltending to go that far. No, neither do I. And But we'll see. It'll, it'll be interesting to see. I think, yeah, the Central, like I said, Colorado, Winnipeg, I think you're going to get better in the Central. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the Pacific. And I think, and we said this last year, too good year for the flames to be as good as they are because i think that a weak pacific division is going to help them out a lot yeah well not only will they probably make the playoffs just due to the fact that they're competent uh they could end up going all the way to the conference finals just because of the fact that hey they have a team with players that can play and you know nobody else in our division really has that claim yeah, I think as soon as you start going up against um, some of the central teams, like, let's say, Winnipeg, let's say, Nashville, I think that's where the Flames are going to start struggling. Yeah. That, but, that's, uh, you know, but like Vegas did last year, you can always upset one team. So and yeah, you, well, at I that rate, you'd only need one. to upset one and you're in the final, so... I think Nashville's big advantage this year is that we've seen great play from both Soros and Rene. So no matter who they put in net, you're probably screwed. Yeah. Have fun with that, kids. <laughs> well, Matt, I think that's about it for us this week. We'll be back next week after the California road swing, which I wish we were both going on. I could use a bit of a tan right now, but we'll be watching those games from home. Note that the first two are late starts, so check your uh, listings if you're going to watch them on TV because we got some late starts there because of the time change. Thank you for listening, everybody. Have a good week, and as always, go Flames Go. Go Flames Go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca. This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Eltador Law. Specializing in family law, wills, and estates for Flames fans in Calgary and southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187. Mention Fireside Chat and get $100 off any legal service. 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 Any legal service.